Okay, welcome my friends uh, here at the Ex-Ombus Podcast, myself, Skullman McClarney, and with me is none other than... Skullman Fawcett, and uh, we are teachers at the Online Chesterton Academy of St. Isidore Learning Center, and this podcast is classical Catholic education in podcast form. It's basically like a sample of what a lesson might be like, and in fact, this particular topic, I believe, is something you've brought up in several lessons, correct, Dr. McClarney? That's or? right. Uh, this, this came up in our... Um philosophy class last year and I, I'm, I'm sure it will come up again as one of the heated debates of the whole semester okay, uh, and right. this had to do with video games uh, now I guess a bit of a background a little bit I think is well, what do we make of video games I mean when first people think of it is are these like a noble art a mm. superfluous uh, uh, or egregious waste of time are mm. they Perhaps they um, are they like a sport, right? Yeah. I mean, you have esports and so on. Yep. So, mm-hmm. what, do, what do we make of video games? I mean, I'm just curious. Uh, we'll get into maybe some of the mm-hmm. philosophical background here in a second. But mm-hmm. uh, what, what do you think? Like when people say video games, what, what comes to your yeah, mind? Yeah. So, well, I mean, when so this is sort of interesting, I, I guess, because I someone once told me I make the most video game references of anyone they know who is uh, not a gamer. Okay. And the reason for that is that I do... I haven't actually played a video game since high school. Wow. I used to play GoldenEye a lot. Around oh, yeah. the time I started my BA, I still yeah. remember... Halo 2 was in the Ascendancy. I remember uh, taking okay. the bus to my college. <laughs> okay. and there was a bar yeah. that's still there, I think. It's oh, one of my Bonnie oh, Dune, and it had sure. a big like sign that said, You can play Halo 2 in here. Oh, really? Or was it Halo 2 or 3? Yeah. Okay. I'd have to look back into the dates there. But, sure. but that was when I realized, like, no, no, the first-person shooter that I'm into... And I actually did, and I haven't played a video game since then. I haven't had a console since then. Yeah. Uh, I did, when I was in China, discover an emulator. Someone had basically uploaded the GoldenEye game oh, onto right. a web page. Yeah. And I actually did, um, during one of my preps, kind of just revisit it, played it awkwardly <laughs> with the keyboard, sure. got back, I played it all the way through, completed it again. Oh, good and sure. even yeah. I could tell it was pretty primitive by today's standards. So, uh. Uh, but the thing is about video games is that even though I don't play them anymore... I'm aware of how important they are. Oh, I can I can sense that they're um, people devote a lot of money to them, right? Okay. They devote a lot of time to them. Yeah. Uh, now people devote a lot of time to Netflix shows too, but you don't have to keep. I mean, I guess you have to pay every month, but you know, like people will right. invest a lot of money into getting video games, and then they'll download the downloadable content, the DLCs that you have to yes. spend more for. Yes. So I'm just I'm aware of them. So I sort of try to be aware of like what's popular. Uh, what the AAA games are and so forth. Like, what are the big controversies? Uh, and I mean, it also, I sort of absorbed it by osmosis. Um, and I don't know, I guess it was about a little over 10 years ago. I did kind of look at the question that the late film critic Roger Ebert oh, got, got in yeah. spats on the internet with people because he maintained that video games are not an art form. Okay. So I would ask people this. Do you consider video games art? And the yes. answer I always got was really interesting. Yeah. This was the most common one. The answer was, not yet. Oh, now, not yet. Not yet. And the reason that's interesting is to me it's kind of a binary. Like, does this fulfill mm-hmm. the criteria of art or not? Like, it's kind of a set of standards. But for most people, what they mean by that is, well, there have been a few really good games, but it's not uh, up to the standards yet, like where they're producing regularly high-quality games that we can consider it an art form in the same way a painting or movie making or something might be. Which I, is not the way I think of it. You know, I don't. I don't think comic books became a, an art form when yeah. they started writing good graphic novels. It, it's either right. this qualifies as art or it doesn't. You know, but most people don't seem to think that way. They thought, well, it was neither. It wasn't that it was. They weren't art or they were art. It's that they're not art yet. They're in the process of becoming an art form, which always struck me as really interesting. So, uh, I, I don't. I, I don't know. I. I have to admit, I think potentially video games could be a really, really important art form, maybe the greatest art form. And Ooh, again, I'm saying this is someone who doesn't play it because, yeah. in the sense that. Uh, I know some people used to argue that movies were sort of the highest form of art up to that point because they combined the oh. most, right? It combined, you know, the elements of storytelling and literature. Yeah. There's kind of a, a poet, almost a poetic aspect right. to it, a visual poetry. Okay. It combines yeah. music. It combines yeah. visual arts. Like, it, it's sort of the synthesis of all of them. Yeah. Video games have all that with an immersive element to it. And almost, and this was an argument I did hear some Christian nerd friend of mine once say, with uh-huh. an element of sub-creation. Of Tolkien's oh, subcreation, yes. he, yes. he argued that uh, Dungeons and Dragons, you know, it was founded by Gary Gygax, who was a, a evangelical Christian. Okay. That the, the roots of uh, board games, yeah. uh, you know, role playing games, yeah. was that to be a kind of subcreation. 
but video games fulfilled that maybe even better, or at least as Ooh, comparably as well. Yeah. So I, so you know, I've had I've heard lots of conversations okay. over the years, but I, so, you know, I don't know if I have an answer yet well, either. So it would be COD or Code Names, uh, right? So, COD or Code Names? Yeah, oh, so, so title have, of this episode locked yeah. in, I'm sure, <laughs> okay. or future PD. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that those are some fascinating uh, questions mm-hmm. to, to raise. So mm-hmm. uh, it, it's it's just an extension, perhaps, of board gaming, but even better, uh, or Going back, I mean, the movie one is probably it may be a discussion for another day. Yeah, uh, the mm-hmm. the art of, of movies and so on, which um, the the one caveat there I might put is most people. I think intuitively we'll say this, or most people generally do say it. The book is better than the movie. The book, so I, sure. there's something to sure. that. But, but okay, we'll, we'll bracket the movie discussion for a second. Well, I'll footnote it though. Say now the distinction between movies and TV shows is really blurring. Right not, not with streaming yeah. and everything, right? You can make like a, I mean, essentially a lot of these shows that are made are just intended to be like ten hour movies. You can watch an installment. Right. So right. It's almost like back to the old um, in the early days of movies where they were movie serials. Right. You know, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we've almost gone back to that to, in to, a way. But so uh, no, but when it comes to uh, video games, there there's some discussion. Well, it's it's there, but not yet, kind of thing. So so mm-hmm. there, there it's it's on its way, but it, it's it's not quite up. all right. And I haven't asked that question for a while. If you poll people now. Maybe people would maybe there'd be more consensus that they are an art form now because there have yeah. been so many award winning games and like yeah. groundbreaking games that are so rich in storytelling. Apparently, you know, yeah. that, I and, don't know. And you know. To broaden it out even further, we might ask: uh, so is it a, like a sport? Uh, so in the sense of like, could it be akin to dance? Oh, yeah. uh, right? Yeah. Or um, in terms of art form, I guess like music and so on. Uh, did, did, would, 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 where does it fit? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. So those those are some of the questions uh, that are being asked. When we got into this in our philosophy class, uh, we were actually delving into Plato's uh, Gorgias, mm-hmm. uh, okay. and in the Gorgias, it's a fascinating dialogue. Basically, long story short, is Gorgias is a sophist. All right, so what's a sophist? Well, a sophist is like a gun for hire, all uh, right? This is like a mercenary uh, philosopher or something like this who is there, to, uh, kind of like a, uh, someone who might help uh, write a stump speech for a politician or even political figures. They're, they're like spin doctors. Yeah. And, almost. And, and sought after mm. uh, because they would have the toolkit you needed to have a successful uh, PR campaign. Right, right yeah, PR uh, consultants or something yeah. like that, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and so Socrates takes, I mean, he uses his skepticism to try and get to the truth of things, and he takes a rather skeptical uh, uh, scapel, uh, you might say, to, to this idea that oratory or rhetoric is a, a vehicle for truth. Hmm. All right, so that, that's kind of where the um, a, a lot of the impetus for the dialogue is hmm. uh, now what's fascinating is they get into this discussion between knacks and crafts all right so what's the difference between a knack and a craft well for plato he first comes up with an example uh, today i mean it might be uh well, comparing pastry baking to a medicine or, or right, hmm. the, the art of uh, the practice of b- b- baking pastries with with uh, a, what a doctor does, right? Hmm. So today it might be something like uh, for these Canadians out there, uh, what's better for you, Tim Hortons or the healthcare system? <laughs> All right, uh, wh- what is it? I mean, what's in your cup there? Uh, anyhow, but, uh, but what do you think you're getting more value for your dollar? <laughs> yeah, where, is, exactly. where is service coming to you more quickly, your local Tim Hortons or your local family doctor? Yeah, sure. And, and, what Socrates argues is that pastry baking puts on the mask of medicine. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And it pretends to know what foods are best for mm-hmm. you. <laughs> right? Uh, and so he says, if a pastry baker had to compete in front of children or teach, no, he doesn't say teachers, but or in front of fools who, 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 who are fo- men who are as foolish as children uh, to determine, you know, what's best. The, what the doctor has to offer you or the pastry baker? Well, um, he says, if that was the case, um, the doctor would die of starvation. <laughs> okay. So uh, even though he has expert knowledge in what's, what's good food. And so for, for Plato or for Socrates, uh, pastry baking, is a, it's, it's like a flattery. It's a type of flattery. It, it guesses at, at what's actually um, good, true, and beautiful, but it doesn't really have an, under, an, an understanding or a mind towards. It's not oriented towards what's best. Mm. All right, so that, that's, it's not oriented towards what is best. 
Mm-hmm. Now, um, so that, that you can understand, you could probably guess where Plato will come down on the Tim Hortons healthcare debate, but uh, uh, this is that's how he um, th- that's how he frames it. So for him, a a, a craft is a techne. Well, that's actually the Greek uh, word that he uses, techne, which uh, gets into um, where we get the word technical from or technology as well as art. Uh, they both come from this term, art is from the Latin side, but uh, nonetheless, as uh, for techne, what does is, what is Plato mean by this? Well, you have to have a, a theoretical understanding, uh, a systematic, rational overview of, of this discipline. Say it's like medicine. You have to know it in and out. Uh, you, and also where it fits into a broader truths or it connects mm. to a broader truth. So in other words, a craft will be, um, if it's good, it, it will connect us, uh, it will allow us to flourish as an individual, it'll help us connect better with those around us, so our polis, mm. right, our community, and by extension, uh, the cosmos mm. and, and, and the fabric of being or the um, et- eternal, the, the realm of forms. Uh, now, uh, for Plato, he gives some other examples, uh, like gym go, or going to the gym. So gymnastics. This would be also uh, a type of craft, and he he likens this to, believe it or not, solid legislation. <laughs> okay, and the pursuit of justice. Mm-hmm. Um, all four parts. So, um, medicine, going to the gym, good legislation, right, and um, and the pursuit of justice. These all connect together because why they are all in pursuit of what's best mm. yeah and so true. so going to the gym well that's good for the body same thing with medicine mm. uh and uh, leg- good legislation as well as justice are good for the soul mm. now if you know anything about plato's republic or he, he has mm. this uh dimorphism between the individual or yeah. the soul and the city, yeah. right? So, so these are all. Well, yeah, that's, that's how it starts. It's like, well, how can an individual be just? Well, individual is too small to look at. Let's look at something big first. See what justice is in that, and then we can figure out what it is in the micro level. So, we know what right. justice is for the city, so that yeah. we know what justice is for ourselves. So, it, uh, the analogy between a sound body. It's interesting. <laughs> thinking of this now, when you talk about a constitution, yeah, you can either that can either be a reference oh, to somebody's right. body and their yeah. health. Yeah. Or it can refer to the legal political system. Yeah. Uh, you can have a, and both of them you want to be healthy. Sure. A healthy constitution for yourself and a healthy constitution right. for your country. Yeah. Maybe there's a platonic uh, sentiment smuggled in in that. In, uh, in the constitution, mm-hmm. yeah, an yeah. individual, yeah. So we build that. We want both uh, to be built up, right? Or mm-hmm. have a firm foundation. I, th- I thought you were going to make an Exodus ninety remark there, uh, or <laughs> something about uh, what's good for the, the the body and the soul, but. Uh, well, that's for another episode. That's another episode. Yes. Cold jars. Okay. Uh, now, so the second category, though, are knacks. Mm-hmm. Okay. So knacks. These are superficial. They they deal with the surface of things, not not like the eternal truths or the internal truth or something like that, or external internal truth. Um, rather, they're not concerned with interconnectivity. They're not concerned with your flourishing uh, okay. per se. Right. Uh, what do they appeal to? Our pleasure centers, mm. uh, right? So they have this immediacy uh, to them, right? Um, <clears throat> and you can become a master in that field quite quickly, <clears throat> again, without a view towards the true, the good, and the beautiful. So are the transcendent. So what would be an example of that? Oh, I'm action. glad you asked. So uh, we mentioned pastry baking. He mm. would also include in there uh, cosmetics and, <clears throat> believe it or not, sophistry. Okay, so exactly what Gorgias is up to, mm. uh, because these deal with the surface of things. Mm. <clears throat> now, on a um, a broader note, there he's going to say oratory mm-hmm. or, or, or rhetoric. This is it masquerades as good legislation, ah. right? So we need legislation, but no, this is oratory. It's just on the surface, it's not getting to actual any actual justice. And um, related to that would be tyranny. Mm-hmm. Tyranny is aping a form of justice, mm-hmm. right? It's not actual justice, right? Mm-hmm. But the tyrant says, you know, we're establishing peace <laughs> by locking you down or whatever it is. Uh, we're going to take over. <laughs> so does a knack masquerade as being a... Uh, I mean, it could be like say calling something social justice, for oh, example. Sure. Or t- saying that your fast food is health food. 
Right. Yes, so yes. They, they disguise themselves as being ordered to the good. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you probably remember this as, uh, I mean, kids maybe don't even watch TV that much anymore, but uh, the commercials that would come on for breakfast cereals, there was always a competition, at least mm-hmm. when I watched yep. on Saturday morning. There was the, yep. it, it always had this line, part of a nutritious breakfast. Yeah. And they, part of a balanced <laughs> breakfast. <laughs> yeah, balanced that's right, yeah. Mm-hmm. And they'd have a picture of... Uh, the you sugariest <laughs> thing you've ever seen. Sure, yeah. sure. This bowl of it, and then next to it is like a glass of orange juice and, and milk yeah, and yeah. maybe mm-hmm. an apple or something. Some stat next to it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. So it's part of yeah. this well-balanced, nutritious breakfast mm-hmm. uh, and, and so on. So uh, that's definitely masquerading, right? Mm-hmm. That, that, that's, that's masquerading is what's good for you. All right. So with that in mind, we then extended our discussion to, well, are video games just like a big gulp of dopamine, <laughs> right? Uh, is that what they are? Or can they lead to our flourishing, right? Do they, do they connect to the fabric of, of the ultimate, right? And what, uh, did, what did your students say? It, it was, it was um, highly contested. Mm-hmm. So there was, uh, I'll never forget this one remark. It, it was very succinct. Um, this, this one girl summed it up well. Uh, and she says, basically... I've observed my brother playing video games. Oh. They are a waste of time. <laughs> and she left it at that. Um, and, and so it was a, um, <laughs> it wasn't an extended philosophical mm. um, treatise or, by any means. Sure. But it was a to the point. Well, it reminds me of what's, what's that famous legal ruling about pornography? Like, well, what's the difference between, like, you know, erotic art and yeah. nudity? Yeah. Well, I know it when I see it. <laughs> yes. How do you know something's porn? I know it when I see it. You know, right. a bit of that. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we we'll, we'll wanted to get to that perhaps later. Now, I'm not mm-hmm. making the argument uh, that video games are tantamount to pornography, but um, when it comes to at least uh, addictive behavior mm-hmm. and addiction, yep. um, this is a. It's not an argument that um, Tolkien makes, but it, but it ties into it. And here, there's going to be a distinction between imagination mm-hmm. and fantasy. Hmm. Ah, okay. uh, have you heard this uh, distinction before? Uh, yeah, and I think Lewis talks a bit about it as well in some of his own reflections. On yeah, it. yeah, mm-hmm. and, and it, so it, um, if you're familiar with Tolkien's going to say about uh, fairy stories or, mm-hmm. or a, a good story, what does it do? Well, it engages our imagination, uh, right? It, it's going mm-hmm. to. It's not a form of escape. Mm-hmm. Right, a, a good secondary, a sub creation, a secondary world. That's something that an, an author or a, a poet creates, right? An artist creates. This is going to allow us to enter into this thought world, this imaginative world of theirs. We know it's not real, mm-hmm. right? We're not we're not fooled into thinking, you know, we're actually in Wonderland or something like that, or we're actually in Middle Earth or Narnia or whatever mm-hmm. it is. We're not fooled by that, but um, this allows us to. Once we put down the book, <laughs> right, mm-hmm. or or done reciting that epic poem or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. It allows us to better interact with and move through this primary world. So, so, so one could say it, it's to move out of the imaginings into the truth. Oh, excellent! Mm, hey. <laughs> Plug for that last episode. Yes. By all means, check that out. Because that does seem to be what Newman thought, right? Newman was very uh, ambivalent, skeptical. He's very denunciatory towards imagination in a lot of his writings. But of course, he also created art. You know, he wrote novels. Yeah. He wrote. Uh, uh, narrative poems and all poems, this, and yeah. it, it seems to be that's how he uh, kind of squared that circle, right? Imagination is dangerous, but you can go through it and out of it into the truth, you know, truth, yeah. if, if it's the right kind of art and you're rightly guided through it, you know, yeah, got it, got it out of it, you know, yeah, <laughs> educated, you know, yeah. So. And, and in this discussion, now, Tolkien doesn't actually bifurcate into these two categories of mm-hmm. fantasy and imagination, but in this, uh, some have, and the the reason why they do this is to say fantasy by contrast will blur the lines yeah. between the imaginative and this world. Mm-hmm. So it's purposely blurring the primary and secondary worlds. Mm-hmm. And, um, well, pornography would be a very good example, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. Uh, and then if something's addictive, in some cases, uh, certainly video games, right? Yeah. Uh, what it's doing is it's not allowing you to better interact with the primary world. Mm-hmm. So it's not a form by which, like, in a good book or a poem, you actually have to animate it with your mind. Like people don't get addicted, uh, right? To you can become I- enraptured mm-hmm. by a work of beauty or an art, but you mm-hmm. become addicted to it, right? Um, the way, yeah, well, again, video games, pornography, and so on can be, right? Mm-hmm. And so that allurement—it's—it's it's, we end up 
being consumed by it or drawn away from our flourishing. Mm-hmm. And so, again, going back to the uh, uh, Platonic understanding of the individual flourishing, you are flourishing in interacting with your family, mm-hmm. uh, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, others around you, your society, your city, and, and, and the cosmos, and so on, the fabric of being, mm-hmm. uh, and the eternal by extension. So, uh, yeah, it's an interesting um, uh, uh, contrast there, that, mm-hmm. that, that um, w- way of looking at it. All right, so... Is that necessarily the case? Yeah, that's so, the question. So that, that, yeah. that's, that, that's, that's the million-dollar question. Now, I mean, doubtless, you can think of some benefits for video games. Like, I don't know if I just asked you off the top of your head, like, what, what, what is gaming uh, or the gamification of things? How, how can that be uh, okay. some benefit, benefits to okay. it? Okay, well, let me, like, off the top <laughs> of my head, I guess. <laughs> any teachers are listening out there on Canvas, your dashboard, oh, they used to have this where it would give you fireworks, like an explosion, <laughs> if you marked all the things you had to mark in Canvas. But yeah, the, the Skinner box would give you a pill. <laughs> <that> you, <laughs> yeah. It gave the bird a little bit I of feed when they completed the, the task. Yeah, yeah what Make awesome. you feel good. Yeah. Which, I mean, does, I, I know, um, they ha- well, actually, I know that they have done studies in email, like getting an yeah. email. I mean, somebody sent you a personal email. It does actually give you a hit of dopamine. That's sure. Sort of similar yeah. to that. So, yeah. Oh, if some, you know, someone's interacting with me, you know. Yeah. Okay, I guess there's levels to this. Um, one can be, I'll try to think, that maybe there's a utility aspect to it, and then maybe I'm trying to think of an intrinsic one, too. Well, yeah. in a utility way, the thing we always hear as teachers is that gamification is a way to make uh, content more interesting, more engaging. Yeah. Um, use that fact that there's something, I guess, addictive about it, or I guess we could say less... Uh, condemnatorily uh, engaging, right? It's very sure, engaging sure, about yeah, it okay. um, and rewarding, I guess. Yeah. Uh, that that can be used to teach um, like math. I know there's a lot of like, yeah. like there's a, a lot of apps and websites that sort of like here's games you can play about math that make yep. solving it rewarding and yep. fun. Or in, uh, in language, for instance, there's a bunch uh, of that with like language. Deal, deal, deal Duolingo. Uh, have you have you tried that? I yeah, I have. Um, and it, yeah, it, it, it's it, it's gratifying. It makes you feel um, well. It, well, see, well, it makes you feel pleased. Yeah. And it also because it's sort of anthropomorphic. Uh, when the owl frowns at you for yeah. not doing enough work, it yeah. makes it, you, it gives you the illusion of like, oh, disappointment. Oh, so you right. want to um, don't let him down. But yeah. not to, yes, without feeling too hard on yourself, I guess. Yeah. Um, on a, on an intrinsic level, well, I remember somebody saying that it's really good for your hand eye coordination. Yeah, sure. Uh, sure. I guess that, I mean I'm in, I, I'm resistant to calling it a sport, but I guess that maybe that is a legitimate. Yeah. You know, well, spatial awareness fits benefit. in there as sure, well. Sure, yeah, more, yeah. Uh, um, multitasking and so on. Yep. And, it, uh, I mean, like any work of art, I guess, if it can tell a, a meaningful and com- compelling and uh, truthful story, um, you know, maybe that's maybe it has that same advantage that every other work of art has. Like I said, people... I, I will say, though, I, I, have, I haven't played video games, but I've listened to some video game soundtracks because I hear them get praised a lot. Okay. Uh, I think, what's the one? Firewatch. It's this. Uh, it's a game apparently about sort of wandering in the forest, and okay. the, it's got this acoustic guitar score. Oh wow! Um, okay. It's very atmospheric, and the, yeah. and it's, and it's also this is similar to movie scores too. Yeah. Um, it's like uh, the cl- the closest thing to classical music we have anymore. Right. Right. Like we don't have that yeah. in pop music for right. for the most part, I think. <laughs> yeah. Right. But the kind of sweeping would, grandeur yeah. music, yeah. you get that more in movie yeah. scores and video game yeah. scores, which so. wouldn't normally get uh, well. Radio play, if, if that's a thing anymore, but I know it's still around. Oh, and but I wish I had looked this up before I go out on camera, but I want to say that I did recently see that the guy who did the music for, was it Halo? Uh, just finished RCIA, just became Catholic. Oh, okay. So may, there, may, maybe there's a case to be made there for ma- that, making that, you know, dabbling in beauty like that, like creating beautiful, um, right. epic, transcendent music, you know, can yes. be a way, gateway into uh, the church, you know. Uh, yeah. So I know there's some, you know, potentially... But I don't know. But intrinsically, though, if there's like those are all like, well, it could be used this way. Is there anything about the video game intrinsically that's valuable? I don't know because by virtue of it being so immersive, right? Like it is, it does seem like it's more immersive than a, even a, a really good movie or TV show. Um, it's because you're you're co-creating the world with it. I don't know if there's anything yeah. about that that I think is intrinsically a good thing. Yeah, I'm like in sure. Minecraft or something like that, uh, where you're co-creating or you're creating, actively creating a world. Or, yeah, yeah al- although I guess the counterpoint is, I guess you could say, that's what we're doing all the time anyways to some extent, is kind oh. of collaborating with each other and co-creating, oh, right. extending God's active creation, I guess, into the yeah. world. So yeah. I'm not sure. Well, what, what, where have you landed on this as you've hashed this out with your students and yourself? Uh, well, I think oh, there's, there's lots that can be said. So uh-huh. people will come up with things like, uh, stress uh, relief oh, or stress management yeah, uh, yeah. reward system 
Uh, which, I mean, people say that like the violent video games are really good for that, actually, just for getting stress out in a uh, pro-social way. I mean, yeah. I, know, I mean that's yeah. a separate topic, but I know yeah. there, there, there was a controversy, especially you know, in the late 90s and all that, about violent video games, do they make kids violent? Uh, and the counterpoint that I've seen is that like in Japan, they're wildly popular, and you, know, you don't have school shootings there or you know, people being violent to each other like you do you know, in the West, necessarily. So uh, the effect of even like, super violent video games is, I think, an, something of an, uh, it's a complicated thing. Right. Does it make people more violent or is it a catharsis? Not to say it's a good catharsis necessarily, but is it a catharsis in a Aristotelian way, I guess? Right. Getting getting that or a Freudian way, maybe, right? Yeah. Getting all that aggression out, uh, you know, in a way that I suppose is pro social, you know. <laughs> and maybe yeah. even communal, because you're doing it with your buddies, right? I mean that's what I would do that's you know, I was Goldeneye, right? And, yes. and Halo was the fun yeah. you yeah. You bonded, ironically, well, over yeah. shooting at each other, right? right. Yes. Uh, yeah. Which I guess that's also paintball or something. I don't know. Yeah, I'm sort of spiraling off here. But like, so what? What? What would you kind of say? Where are you? Where are you going? Oh with this? well, there's there's lots that could be said there. I think uh, yeah, something with, with the violent violence. I think there, there's some debate there because yeah. there is some correlation, and again, that that. Mm-hmm. The debate comes in between cause and effect and correlation. Right. Exactly. But, yeah. But yeah. Given that there is a correlation, there. Do, there's probably something worrisome there, mm-hmm. at least certainly if you're in the North American context mm-hmm. and so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, there's a list you can come up with for or against, right? So so the, <laughs> yeah. the cons would be like excessive screen time. Yeah. Uh, we mentioned already um, addiction, but also it could be dependency. Uh, now, there's an interesting one, though, you mentioned about uh, multiplayer games where you, you form a team because there's something mm-hmm. certainly very tribal about uh, sports. Yeah. So, for instance, I mean, team sports at least right whether it's basketball or or rugby or whatnot you're part of a um a tribe essentially Mm -hmm. you have your own logos your own mascots right you have a regime that you train it it kind of takes over much of your life in in the season Mm -hmm. um and there's a profound bonding that happens in that Mm -hmm. um and again that can also be a proxy for well in, in a good sense, it, you know, uh, like say Father Bonner and so on, uh, others uh, who view sports as a way of disciplining um, ourselves for for mm-hmm. flourishing, right? Uh, mm-hmm. and, and certainly, it can be used um, in other ways too, like uh, directing us towards war. Like it's very much mm-hmm. a proxy, yeah, yeah, uh, training yeah. grounds for that as well. Um, but in any case, um, so the question there becomes: Is that a true bonding, right? So, so, mm-hmm. so, it, or does this actually lead to more social isol- isolation uh, because? My best friends are ones that are digital or something right, like that. Right, yeah. Uh, again, uh, I don't know if you can answer that right now, but th- 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 that's... Well, that I mean, it does sound like what Marshall McLuhan anticipated, right? That um, the digital world... I mean, in one sense, the old national boundaries were erasing in the digital world, but yeah. that we were now in kind of a new global village. Right. Um, and, he, and he would have said that digital media... This is funny, because this is like before video games really yes. but he, he thought that they were you know because he, he sees technology as being extensions of ourselves right like right. you know the glasses are the extension of your eyes the wheel is the extension yeah. of the foot yeah. uh, he thought that the computer was the extension of the nervous system ah. and I, I mean video games are a real I mean like people like you jerk around when you're being shot at you know yes, I mean? in that's a game right. Yeah. right so yeah that's interesting too because yeah it, um, it's a new kind of community and you could say it's not real or you could say it's interesting because I do know that there was a phrase okay, that, but if yeah. the computer is the extension of our nervous system mm. um, and then we're in a network right yes, as yeah, yeah. Going, does this mean like we're bonding at a more profound level in that sense I, I'm not sure like if, if uh, the fact that it's not physical I mean it's more angelic which is a good right. and a bad thing, mm, right? Because okay. it's less incarnational, now. Yes. but it's all. But it's also it, there's that lack of, of, of being present in that sense. Mm-hmm. But it's also because it, it's it's purely your personality at that point, in some sense, that you're sharing with somebody. Mm. So in a way, that can be almost a short. Well, it's like online dating or something, right? It's almost like right. a shortcut to that part of your personality. Hey, yes. You don't have the preliminary stuff. So yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's and and I was going to say that, that that could be yeah, another episode. Sure, that I, could be a whole other. I know thing, a but, lot of. Um, Couples that we know, families that we know, that's how they met. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and so there seems to be something to it. Uh, certainly seeing lots of fruits in, in, the, in the community. Well, a, fra- a phrase that I have heard that apparently was used by the cyberpunk sci-fi writers back in the 80s was um, uh. meat space. Oh. So there's the there's the digital space and then there's meat space. Because they okay. didn't want to, I think they didn't want to talk about this is the real like, world and that's the M- fake world. E-E-T. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> no, M-E-A-T. Oh, okay. Because we're made so of meat. Yeah, like oh. meat space. Like where we all... 
I guess it's probably a pun. Like we right. meet in person, uh, okay. but it's also like it's where our, it's like that's where our minds are, but this is where our meaty parts are. And okay. I've used that phrase jokingly a few times with my students, and I should stop because I did have a student write in an exam that Thomas Hobbes believes only in the empirical world, which makes him a meatiest. Um, which spelled it spelled okay. M E A T I E S T, which uh, so <laughs> a mater- not a materialist but a meatiest. So meatiest. I bring that all up just to say, like, <clears throat> is the digital realm necessarily like the unreal realm, or right. is it more complicated than that? I'm not sure, right? So I, I, I don't I don't think those communities are necessarily. I mean, especially post COVID, and especially given our context as online teachers, I don't know if it. I can really say that it's not real. Or is it real in a different sense? I'm not sure. That's another yeah. topic. Well, I, I think, I yeah, the way students who are able to participate in retreats and so on in person, uh, they'll definitely tell you um, sure. there's, there's something more happening. Yeah, oh, totally, uh, yeah. Uh, mm. Okay, here, what I think might be helpful to do, and, and give a framework for our listeners, mm-hmm. uh, whether you're talking about video games or, or sports or music or art, um, or what it is, uh, it's helpful to have a, a some paradigm or a framework to understand what we mean by beauty. Mm. Uh, so mm-hmm. maybe we can speak a bit about beauty, and then if we have time, we can circle back to leisure. I know we've talked about leisure in the past, mm-hmm. but yeah. I think leisure is also another important one because that that's another um, uh, reason, I suppose, uh, mm-hmm. that people engage in, in, in video games, right? Mm-hmm. Or it should be, at least. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so right, right, right. Yeah. free time, not that uh, uh, yeah. not the other way around. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but in any case, um, so here... What is beauty? Now, that, that's that's a one that um, a very broad mm-hmm. question. I, th- I think to start, it might be helpful to distinguish, at least in our context here, between beauty and entertainment. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what's the difference between beauty and entertainment? And some of this comes from um, uh, George Grant, but uh, basically what he says is that entertainment, uh, we could define that as the agreeable occupation of our time. <laughs> okay, uh-huh. so it's it's eminently practical, but it's something that we <clears throat> agree to. Uh, focus our attention on something. So it's the agreeable occupation of our attention. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, now entertainment is also something that we consume. Mm, Yes. Right. And as such, it's it's transactional, uh, right? So we Mm -hmm. are going to um, pay for it and entertainers will rightly have an expectation to be compensated. Mm -hmm. uh, Right. Um, So uh, here, uh, that's part of it as well. In some of its nefarious forms, entertainment can consume us. Mm. Uh, so, it, so that that is almost reversed in some ways, uh, it, where it becomes addictive and so on. But um, nonetheless, entertainment is something that is transactional, right, mm. and and practical. Mm. Okay, all right. Um, now, contrast this to beauty. Beauty does capture our attention, like like entertainment, uh, but. It isn't something that we consume, mm. uh, or at least we can't exhaust it. Uh, and then we can't uh, consume it in the sense of uh, depleting, uh, depleting it or, uh, and vice versa. It doesn't deplete who we are. So it doesn't mm. diminish okay. who no. we are. Mm. Uh, so it's quite the opposite. Beauty is something that leads to our flourishing. Mm. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, uh, so, and it, in this sense, it's, um, we'll get to the objective bit in a second, but by being objective in, in, in this limited sense, what we mean here is it draws us out of ourselves. So it's not something that just takes place mm. within the subject. Mm-hmm. Right? Okay. Yeah. So, so in, in um, Plato, would, I guess, and others would say it's a uh, participation. Yeah. Right. So, so in that sense, it's uh, beauty involves participating in something greater. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, now, uh, in that case, you know, it could be a Shakespearean drama or a. a, a Mozart's uh, concerto or something like this, but uh, now okay. Some of you might say, "Well, hang on a second. I'm not. I don't. I don't go in with any of that Plato stuff, right? right? right. We're, we we live in the postmodern world. Sure, yeah. um, you know, there's many interpretations out there. Mm, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> yeah, yes. that's right. Okay, we'll come back to that one. Uh, mm. And there are many facts, right? Mm. Um, so how do we know what to pay attention to, mm. right? Um, and and who are you to judge? You know that the Teenage Mutant right. Ninja Turtle comics are any way less than the, what we find in the Sistine Chapel. Sure. Right. Yes. Right. So so again, going back to what you just mentioned there, isn't beauty in the eye of the beholder? It's all subjective, isn't it? Yeah. Oh. yeah. Now again, if you um, you start to ask that question, I mean, how might we respond? If, if we're going to say beauty is something objective, now here let me give you 
four points. Mm-hmm. I, I'm curious what our listeners would say. You know, someone just asks you, oh, how do you know beauty is a real thing? Mm-hmm. Isn't it just a subjective experience? Uh, now, uh, George Grant makes this point, but about the beauty in the eye of the beholder, mm-hmm. he, he raises the question, well, okay, then what's beholding us? Yes. <laughs> right? yeah, so yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, if something is drawing our attention, right? if something beholds us, then certainly beauty is more than just a subjective experience. Yes. Right, right. Something's holding on, yes. Uh, yeah, so... We're, we're enthralled to it. We're enslaved by something other than ourselves, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In that sense, by definition, it's objective, mm-hmm. right? There's some other object yeah. Yeah, out yeah. there. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, um, how about this, though? Uh, okay, well, no, no. Beauty is just a sentiment, right? Mm-hmm. It's just this subjective thing. And this is a kind of Hume's argument, yeah. uh, right? So he's going to say, well, well... Hmm, we have a dilemma, right? Is beauty like intrinsic uh, in in an object, or is its attributes actually, um, or is beauty just an attribute of the observer, uh, basically, right? So is it just a sentiment that we have? And he basically comes down to saying, well, there's no standards hmm. for judging beauty, so don't bother. It just it's just a sentiment. Yeah. All right. So, uh, all right. Uh, so it merely exists in the mind that contemplates them, says, mm-hmm. says Hume. Uh, all right, so um, how might you respond to that, right? How, how, might, how might you respond to Hume? Um, mm-hmm. One way is um, the fact that we appreciate critics, right? Yeah. We appreciate mm-hmm. judges, right? Yeah. So we are critical of critics, yes. <laughs> right? And, and what does that mean? Well, basically... Um, if we can evaluate others who evaluate, which we think some are better critics than others, that means there must be some standard, even if we can't articulate what it is. Mm-hmm. Maybe we don't have all the facility or training. Um, there's still some standard out there, mm-hmm. right? And the fact that we do think some critics are, are more perceptive than others points to that. Yeah. So it's not just simply – because if it was just subjective, well – I can. My sentiment is only in me. I don't. I don't know your sentiment, and never can. So it, that, all that would do is, is make it would make critics a different kind of entertainer, right? Which I think is what yeah. sort of happened. Like there are people, uh, you know, video. Uh, there's mm. people who put out videos that are like, uh, oh, and, and they're critics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Or video, and, and there are critics. They're they're commenting on new albums or new movies. Um, yeah. But it, you know, they're entertainers. It's fun. Like it's yeah. supposed to, like you watch it. Not, you know, people will say, and then even they'll say that. So they're like, it's just my opinion. You don't have to agree with me. Well, if that's the point, then the only reason to watch you is because I might think that you happen to be funny. I, I have something to learn from you at that point, or you're, you know, entertaining or something. If there's if there's anything insightful about you, that must mean that's because I mean, I, when you said some critics are more perceptive than others, yes, to perceive means you you see something, like yes, you can sense that's something. Right. You know? um, so it's actually quite an anti. Uh, it, it really makes critics almost useless to say that beauty is just subjective, right? right as yeah. far as that goes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or at best, they're mere entertainers, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. At best, yep. Uh, okay, it's just a knack. It's just a knack. Okay. That's right. Uh, here's here's a third argument. I call this one the uh, the teacher argument. So I'll see if you buy into this all one. Right, all right. <laughs> Are any other teachers out there? Uh, okay, so here, um, let me ask you this: um, Why teach? Like, is why not? Why this job? Why not another? Um. I, I mean, for, I think it's well. Part of it's that it's a vocation, oh, okay. right? I think I feel. Well, I'm asking the wrong person. Paul okay. do it. Yeah, yeah. Right. Oh, I mean, it's for a paycheck, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's the answer I was looking for. Okay, so <laughs> the number one answer might be, well, it, it could be a transactional and practical one. At least if you first ask a teacher, right? Sure. Just, oh, it, sure. So yeah, you yeah. know, it it paid more than my summer job at Home Depot. Yeah. So that's why I went for my after ed uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. degree, right? It, it, so, it's harder for them to fire me than Home Depot. <laughs> yeah, they're right. Take union protection. Yeah. So. so you know, when your feet hit the floor in the morning and you're you know, thwart with our. Interrogated by those existential questions, why am I doing this? Uh, right? Yes. Um, you know, because uh, it, it it pays more. All right. Here's an answer we don't want to hear is because I'm a bossy pants, all right? And I thrive sure. on bossing people sure. around like students, or if mm-hmm. I'm in uh, teachers and so on. Uh, now, the answer we probably want to hear is for the kids. Yes. Right? Yeah. It's it's for the students. Uh, and here, this is this is actually hard to describe to others who haven't taught. But mm. teaching is enrapturing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, certainly, um, teaching at its best. Uh, what's happening here? There's a transmission of knowledge, but uh, as Plato would say, it's it's also a participation in otherness, uh, it, it, both the teacher and the student in the eternal. Now, Augustine might say uh, something like, uh, "Teaching is a way of 
learning how to love things as we ought to. And, and so for him, uh, what a teacher is more like a midwife who helps uh, Christ, the internal teacher, to help the individual know what is good and, and what's best. Mm-hmm. And what, uh, so how to move and direct the students, the internal Christ. Uh, right. So... Um, Coming back to does beauty exist? Well, mm-hmm. what I would ask then, the, the teacher argument is this. Is teaching just in the eye of the beholder? Is this mm-hmm. job just mm-hmm. as good as any other? Um, and on your best days, what beholds you? <laughs> right? What beholds mm-hmm. you? Uh, so, again, um, beauty, we'd say, is, is, is much more than just sentiment. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, it, it taps into something what is grand. Mm. Yeah. Um, so th- th- those are um, some of the arguments uh, that, oh, there's a fourth one. Mm. Uh, I call this the, um, the Andy Dufresne argument. Uh, and this is he's a character in um, uh, Shawshank Redemption. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. A very violent movie. I wouldn't recommend this. As it's certainly not a family movie to watch. Uh, but it, the, the plot is um, it's, it's in a prison, mm. right? And it's, it's um, run by a tyrant. Mm. Uh, uh, and it's, it's this drudgery uh, this life where people become institutionalized yeah mm-hmm. yeah and so the, the protagonist Angie um, with a little help of Mozart uh, there's this beautiful scene yes. in the middle mm-hmm. where he gives he, he turns on this uh, it's a Mozart uh, um, uh, opera or, or one that you did music for and puts it on the the PA system mm. and for a moment everything stops mm. in in Shawshank mm. uh, and here the um, prisoners guards alike their eyes are wondering what is this now what's fascinating about that scene is they don't understand the language mm. they they don't know the opera mm-hmm. right they're probably not familiar with the genre at all <laughs> right yeah yeah <laughs> right but there's something recognizable mm-hmm. about that Mozart piece mm-hmm. that draws their attention. And for a moment, this is the, the dangerous thing of this act, is it gives them hope. Mm-hmm. So um, beauty, then, is something that allows us uh, to find ourselves in this world. It gives us a, allows us to find our place. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so mm-hmm. um, if you want to think of um, beauty, then, in this sense... It's this otherness which points us to there's more in this world uh, than what we just see, what more than meets the eye. Mm, mm. Yeah. Uh, so it points us beyond ourselves. All right. Now, uh, what does that have to do with video games? Well, for video games, then, um, again, does it fall, fall under the category of something transactional and practical? Right? Uh, on some level, it's got to, yeah. Yeah, I guess it was called the. Uh, Nintendo Entertainment System for a reason, exactly, yes. <laughs> uh, right? Um, uh, or, or can I do more, right? So, in terms of genres, mm-hmm. I don't think beauty is limited to just you know uh, music or the visual arts or, mm-hmm. or, or epic poems. Uh, so, there, um, it's certainly something to think about. Yeah. Um, it led back to uh, we talked about McLuhan there earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the hurdle that I guess video games would have to surmount is the uh, media is the message, mm-hmm. uh, right? So is the 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 genre that's just tied to this this medium? Um, does that necessarily delimit or or um, attenuate the extent that beauty can? become active right mm. through through video games so in other words um the way that we consume them or this particular genre uh, um does that then mean that um it's intrinsic to 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 the screen right that mm. we can't have um not, yeah, again uh, that 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 we become ensnared by it, that it actually devolves into entertainment or or a knack mm. uh, right um so that, 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 I think that's the one of the hurdles it has to mm. surmount. Yeah. Well, McLuhan said that the thing about you know this new media is that it, you are the screen, right? You go to a movie theater and yeah. you're seeing something uh, you know, right. broadcast yeah. onto the screen. Sure. With television, yeah. you are the screen, right? right? It's it, it's spre- um, firing light at you. And he had this idea, which you know is sort of controversial, whether it's scientific. That that, that yeah. meant that we had to kind of assemble what was coming at us. Like we, you know, yeah. and absorb it, and like our brains had to kind of um, 
he, he talks about it like being reorientalizing or something. <laughs> like yeah. we have, to, and I guess so. So uh, video games would be like that. In video games, you're the screen. It's it's projecting at you, and your brain is kind of doing the active work of assembling that. You know, uh, all those all those beautifully animated uh, details. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and making sense yeah. of it yourself. Yeah. Um, I mean, I get. I mean, the screen type. Like, there's, there's also the health question about that. That, that McClure's not really talking about that. He's just describing how you know when lights being shone at you. It does. It, it's a different medium in that sense than going to a theater or watching a slideshow. You know, in the church basement or something like that. Yes. Where yeah. you're watching something else being shone at. You, you know, yeah. he, uh, as opposed to light being shone directly at you. What oh, is, what I is see. That, what does that yeah. mean, right? That light's yeah. being shone at you. You're the screen now. You know. Yeah. Not sure, but that, yeah, that does that does put video games in a different uh, light. No pun intended. <laughs> yes. Um, so what what else do you think that we have to take into account when considering well, this? You know? I guess leisure uh, would mm-hmm. be the other one. Yeah. Uh, and we've talked about this a little bit, but uh, I mean, what, what is leisure? Generally, we understand it as our excess time, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> uh, for students, uh, okay, well, we can get into this a little bit, but uh, I think we didn't have a chance to mention this last time we talked about leisure, but scholate, right? Mm-hmm. So the the Greek word for the time you have in between work is skole. <laughs> so uh, this is the whence word, we get school. Where we get the word school mm-hmm. from? Uh, and so, it, okay, granted, today it's a little bit you don't recognize as much in our school calendar because uh, mm-hmm. we do a summer break, which was the time you're supposed to go to work and do agrarian yes, activities right. and mm-hmm. so on. Uh, students kind of don't really see it that way anymore. And they mm-hmm. go, okay, that, this is our break. Yes. And school is drudgery. Oh, who would ever think something like this? But in any case, uh, yeah. So mm-hmm. school A, though, means this, this break away from uh, our work. And so, in other words, we're not fixing uh, a roof over our heads or um, we're not occupied now with acquiring food or as Hobbes would have it, securing our homes uh, from inevitable war, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So Scully is that in-between time and that is where we can start to, well, learn. And Mm -hmm. so in... um, uh, it, comes, it comes from the Latin side, uh, where we get leisure uh, from like license, but also mm. from liber, our freedom. Um, this is the the time when we have this opportunity to become freer uh, versions of ourselves, right? Mm. Or through through the arts, right? Or the liberal arts, uh, we mm. can we can engage in this. All right. So um, when it comes to um, video games, is th- this would be the distinction. Is it part of just entertainment, uh, which is which is a function of work, right? Uh, or is it something different, right? Is it is it truly leisure? So to go back to the how how what's how does um, uh, entertainment time with uh, work? Well, work is um, Joseph Piper who who talks about you know leisure, the pursuit of uh, culture, uh, uh, or the heart of culture. It, um, he he talk, he's he's engaging in a world that's dedicated to total work. It's post-World War II. Mm. Everyone is occupied yeah, with rebuilding, yeah. and this is what life is all about. Work, work, mm. work, work. Uh, today, we might have something similar uh, where we might dispense with our, our day job, but then we get into this mode of total entertainment, yeah. right? Where we're just inundated with more stimuli, mm. as opposed to actual leisure. Mm. So, for, as Piper points out, uh, leisure is actually a disposition of the heart, mm. right? It's an attitude of the mind mm. to um, perceive what is actually around us, objective reality, and to appropriate it. So is a video game something that allows you to better perceive reality as it is? Mm. Does it... How does it change the disposition of, of your heart or your, the attitude in your mind, right? Mm-hmm. How does it do that? Um, or is it something that becomes ultimately insular, mm-hmm. right? Draws you into something and occupies your time. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's a couple things. I, 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 of course, looking at the clock here. But, like, a couple things I'd say. I, I, I know the, or I believe I've heard, that the Orthodox uh, spiritual writer, Father Seraphim Rose, he once said that the idea of fun is a modern idea. Right. Oh, okay. Um, which I, I mean, I guess in the past, maybe if you were like a Oriental despot with a harem, maybe you knew what you, know, you had fun. Most people didn't have fun. Like fun is a very modern concept. He would argue. Okay. I sort of think of maybe leisure as like the Aristotelian mean, or maybe that's not the right way of thinking of it. But because, oh, but right. you know, there's, there's like there's yeah. you know leisure there's there's work 
yeah. right? It's servile work. Yeah. There's fun, uh, and those are, neither of those are necessarily bad, I guess. But yeah. leisure would be somewhere in the middle where it's not, it's not exactly right. fun because it's not just passive, but it's yeah. also like there's an active element to it. You know, like when yeah. you're when you're reading a really good. Uh, book or reading or even reading scripture, right? You're doing lecture to be in or something. There's an activity. There's sort of like activity that's not uh, functional or something like that. Yeah. Like there's like the, as opposed to servile work. So maybe there's somewhere in between the two of them. Oh wow. Um, yeah. I don't that's know. a yeah. fascinating way of thinking. Yeah. About I don't know. Especially yeah. lecture divina, right? Yeah. Because uh, our prayer is not simply something like we're automatons, like robots worshiping mm-hmm. this deity in the sky, and we're just doing our duty. Mm-hmm. Um, but rather, no. This is a disposition. Uh, yeah, right. it kind of contains elements oh. of both because there is a, there's an element of work too, especially if it's a cl- like a classic text. Often that does involve like a level well, of engagement that's yeah, almost more like work. Yeah, but it is also, also is like enjoyable in a way that and fun. Like it's fun to read these two, or should be in theory. So like maybe leisure combines a bit of both. I don't know. That's a whole other thing. The relevance of that to video games. The thing I was wondering as you were talking is is there a way of structuring video games? Um, like for example, is a single player game more or less disposed to, I guess, orient you towards virtue than a, what do you call it, a massive online multiplayer game or whatever? Sure. Yeah. And I don't know offhand. Like, would, a, would the MMO or whatever, like, yeah. does that inc- uh, encourage a collaboration in a way that the individual one doesn't? Or does it, or is it all situational? Because when you're around a bunch of other people online, you know, maybe it's the lowest common denominator thing where everyone's swearing right. at each other. Yes. Yeah. It, and, and then the question is, is it all, it, is it all just depending on how it's used? Or is there anything? I mean, McLuhan's point is that we need to not think it in simplistic terms. You know, like Grant says the same thing. You can't just say, "Oh, you know, a computer's not good or bad." It's all how you use it. Because there is something about technology that does sort of dictate how it's used. Yeah. Um, although, that, but that doesn't necessarily mean for good or for bad. Um, and I, the other thing I was thinking about, I remember um, <laughs> uh, there used to be Grand in Media, uh, our local archdiocese yes. used, yeah, yeah, yeah. used to have uh, left footers. I used to be on that show. I remember uh, Father Roger Najowski and Father Robert Lee did have an episode on video games, and they okay. talked a bit about um, you know virtue in video games. And I remember they brought up that uh, uh, some people online will try to play video games in character as a religion. So like some people play Super Mario Brothers oh, right. as a like a, well, a vegetarian. So you, oh. you never jump on any of the mushrooms. Like, you never kill mushrooms. Oh, really? I didn't know. Or a Buddhist. A Buddhist, I think. Uh, okay. Yeah, apparently people will, like, just uh, see, can you play all the way through yeah. Super Mario Bros. Okay. Without, or without killing anything, maybe, because you're, like, a Buddhist or something, and you, yeah. don't, and you believe in the sanctity of all life. Yeah. Uh, which leads me to think, um, like, could you play, I, I mean, I guess video games would often encourage you to kill as many people as possible. Could you, would it be about destruction a video game to see if you could get through a scenario uh, with as little killing as possible, and you'd get some kind of initial or like some kind of reward for that. Would, would that be a way of structuring a video game that's entertaining but also teaches yeah. virtue or inculcates well, virtue? I mean, Tetris might be an example. I mean, it even has, I think, uh, you know, a church on the cover of it, right? But uh, so, so Tetris, you're not really killing anything, right? You're just I, rearranging I shapes and so on. But um, yeah, maybe. I feel like Tetris was came out of the Soviet Union and was meant to teach. <laughs> yeah. that, that's fun. That's teaching that's you true. the value of hard work or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't know. So that, I guess that's my lingering question I don't have an answer to is, is there anything about – is is just the video game medium something that can be designed in one way or the other? And, and it, whether it's virtue inculcating or not, it just all depends on how it's designed and how it's played. Or is there any way of designing video games where it inherently – I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's back to the question of, of genre or media, right? So mm-hmm. the medium in which it uh, is transmitted, right? If, and that even goes possible. to, actually, and I do remember someone else, uh, my friend who said that it was a form of sub-creation, said that he thought it was more, uh, how did he phrase it? It was like, that he thought it was more moral to have a first-person game than a third-person game because a third-person game gives you a kind of God's eye view. Oh. Whereas if you're in a first-person, it, 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 there's more humility involved. You can only see what your character oh, sees. Oh, right. Um, that's maybe why I, I, that's why I don't like first person games. <laughs> they also give me a headache too. Like Goldeneye, there's like there's too much spinning of the screen. That is true. Well, yeah. yeah. Whereas oh, the, gosh, third, yeah. the third uh, the third person perspective, it's like at least I can don't get a headache. I guess yeah, that's yeah. something to be taken into account. But maybe or maybe you're just not willing to submit some submit constraints to, of being a creature. <laughs> that's right. right. You want to be true. angelic or something. So I don't know. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Um, <laughs> probably not. So well, that's I mean, like, I hope we can maybe do a follow up on this because I'd love to hear more from students actually about this. Um, I imagine I, I would assume maybe there was a split between the ladies and the gentlemen in your classroom about this topic. There was, believe it or not. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm curious what the boys would say in defense of video games. Yeah. Um, 
But yeah, maybe 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 we can uh, follow up on this later because I want to think about this more. You've given okay. me plenty to chew on here for today. But. Okay, fair enough. I'll leave you with one last thought. All right, is that um, leisure is only possible when people are at peace with themselves. Mm. So yes, does does a video game make you? Uh, give you a sense of peace or is it a cause of agitation uh right uh or are you constantly thinking about it and so on or whatever uh, and so uh, pope benedict uh points out that uh, leisure is not an escape right from one's mm-hmm. work but it's appreciation of existence uh that has a divine dimension that we don't mm-hmm. normally see wow. so so to tie that in then ultimately the, the thought is does it bring you to peace, right? That peace mm. of the Sabbath day, right? That yeah. that rest mm. uh, in God. Because, I mean, that's that's what um, leisure, I guess, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. ultimately directs us towards is the Sabbath rest, yeah. right? The Sabbath day. Mm. Okay. Uh, on that note, uh, do you, would you want to close with a word of prayer? Sure, absolutely. Okay. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Lord, uh, we thank you for uh, the opportunity to discuss topics like this. We ask that uh, as we make decisions about how we will pass our time, uh, what we will do with our minds and our bodies, we would be guided by your glory, glorifying you and growing in virtue and becoming closer to Christ, more like Christ, letting Christ grow in us. It would always be our priority and our guiding light. Lord. Uh, we trust in you, Lord. We thank you for your guidance. And uh, we offer up everything we do to you. And as we pray, glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as As it was was in the beginning, beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen.